You know, I've noticed that the modern conversation about God and about religion in our culture has now decided that if there is a God, he must be a loving God. And I guess that's a, a pretty good thing for us to assume, that we're discussing a loving God. And yet, the weird thing about it is that a lot of people in their discussions about religion use the nature, the loving nature of God against him. What do I mean? Well, for example, the people who say, well, if God is a loving God, why does he allow so much trouble and suffering and evil and pain in the world? Or, or if God loves me, then if he should let me live the way I want to live. If God loves me, he's the one who made me this way, so I should be allowed to live by an alternate lifestyle. Um, and then there are those who say, my life is so miserable. How could God possibly love me? Here's the problem. In all of those um, uh, statements about God, they're using a defective definition of love. It's a human definition of love, not God's definition of love. And you know, it's pretty obvious to us that there are people who define love, humanly speaking, in ways that are a little bit defective. Think of the parents that you sometimes see that, that are so, that, that think that the loving thing to do is to give their children everything. That the loving thing to do is to protect their children from any challenge, any problem, any difficulty. Is that really love? Or what about the people who think that the loving thing to do is not to confront a friend who has a self-destructive behavior. Is, is, is that really the loving thing to do? Well, let's see what God says love is by looking at God's word to us in, in the first epistle of John, chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. It reads like this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Hello, this is Pastor Jim Ponko with the Sunday uh, devotion for May 9th, 2021. You know, if you, if you look at that def definition that John here gives of God's love, you'll notice one thing, and that is that God's love is, is more than just a warm, fuzzy feeling, right? When God loves, he acts. This is the way John put it. He said, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world. You know, sometimes people do question whether God is a loving God because, well, they see so much trouble and evil in this world. And they say, why didn't God do something about it? And the answer is he did. He saw the evil in the world and decided that he would enter the world to provide a solution for the evil. And so what did he do? He experienced all the corruption, all the cruelty, all the racism, all the violence, and all the betrayal that the world could dish out. Jesus was like us in every way except that he was without sin. And he did that in order to save us. John explains, he says, He, that is God, sent his one and only Son into the world so that we might live through him. John uses a special word for live there. It's, it's, a, it's a word that means a vital life, a, 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 a life that has real meaning. It, it, it's, it's more than just uh, being upright and taking nourishment. It's the same word that Jesus used when he said, I have come that they may live and live to the fullest. God wants more for us than 70 or 80 years of mere existence. He wants us to have a vital, meaningful, hopeful, joyful, peaceful, and eternal life beginning now 
and continuing forever. And that's the kind of life that is only possible if we are in close connection with God. When people question God's love because of the challenges and, and problems that they face in life, they are also forgetting that God is lovingly preparing us for a perfect life to come. And that sometimes he does that by drawing us closer to him and making us more dependent on him by the troubles that we face in life. And that he also gives us a more realistic picture of the disappointing nature of this world by the frustrations that we face. But Jesus does more. John writes, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. What John is really saying there is that we did not pursue God. God pursued us. God took the initiative to save us. He didn't wait until we would finally realize that we needed his help and ask him for us. He came to us and showed us the need. I saw an interesting article about a, a psychological study that was done recently. A group of psychologists were studying uh, uh, the human nature and, and how we view happiness. And they, they, they drew a very interesting conclusion in their study. They, they found that the more obsessed that people become with finding happiness, the less likely that they are to find it. And they gave a couple of interesting reasons. First of all, because most people they found don't know what makes them happy. And in addition, they don't really know and understand what happiness is. And so as a result, they become obsessed with being happy and end up disillusioned by the search. What's my, my point in bringing up that, that study? Well, so often people want God to make them happy. But the problem is, they don't even really know for sure what happiness is. But God does. <coughs> he knows where joy can be found. And it is found in a vital, living connection with Him. In fact, that's how He made us. As, as one wise Bible scholar said, there is a hole in our hearts that can only be filled by God. But we turn away from God. We pursue happiness and everything but God. And so that's why God pursues us. So that he can show us where joy is found. But God also understood what it would take to make such a relationship, such a, such a close connection with him possible. And that's why John explains, he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, what stands in the way of our relationship with God is not God, it's our sin. The word sin, as you probably know, literally means to miss the mark. What it reminds us is that we are constantly aiming in the wrong direction. For example, we think that we'll find contentment if we're wealthy enough. And unfortunately, many people sacrifice their families or their marriage just to try to get that elusive contentment. Sometimes people think that alcohol or gambling or porn or food or gossiping will make them feel better about themselves, but in reality, it it only turns them away from God. So Jesus came and he made what John calls the atoning sacrifice. That is, he paid the price to satisfy God's justifiable anger for the way that we have ruined our lives and sometimes ruined the lives of others as well. And the just penalty for the abuse of all these lives, well, that would be for us to lose our own life. But that's the price that Jesus paid, right? He died on the cross. That, that's what we Christians say again and again. Jesus died on the cross for us. But maybe we use that phrase so much that it's lost its impact. Think for a moment what it really means. It means that God loved us so much 
that God died for us. But it wasn't just Jesus who demonstrated that love for us. Yes, he's the one who made one sacrifice, the sacrifice of his own life. But remember that his heavenly Father also demonstrated his love by sending his one and only Son. Think about that. God the Father sent the most precious thing that he had, his only Son. And he sent him to die for you and me so that we could experience eternal life, a new life, a, a communion with him. That's love. God's love that he chose to demonstrate because he wanted to do more than just bring a little bit of happiness into our short, difficult lives. He wanted us to have a new life. John goes on, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You know, it's interesting. What in essence John is saying here is God not only wants us to stop trying to impose human definitions of love on him, God also wants us to start imposing his definition of love on ourselves. He is calling us to love others in the same way that he has loved us. Yes, that means providing for their physical needs, right? As the Bible often says, God calls us to feed the hungry and care for the sick and clothe the naked. But God also wants us to learn to love others as he loved us, to be concerned not only about our physical needs, but about our real spiritual, eternal needs. He wants us to have the kind of love that sees that need and acts, that, that is concerned about both body and soul, a love that takes the initiative, a love that is sacrificial, a love that seeks to bring the message of reconciliation to those who are still estranged from God. God calls us to a love like His that forgives and that has compassion even for those who have turned against us. And we hear ourselves saying, but, but I'm the one who is hurt by that person. And Jesus says, yeah, but I was the hurt one that was hurt by your sins. And we, we complain, but I'm the one that she insulted. And Jesus says, yes, but you've insulted me by your words. Or we say, that person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. And, and God says, do you really think that you deserved mine? But I forgave you anyway. Do you see how God loves us? He is not first concerned about the fleeting happiness that we might find in this life. He is focused on giving us eternal joy. He is not first concerned about stomping out all evil in the world right now. He is rather concerned about leading evil sinners to repentance. He is less concerned about what we want and more concerned about what we truly need, an eternal living relationship with Him. He has poured His love into our hearts. He has made us His own. And now He wants us to be a pipeline through which His love is poured into the lives of those around us. That is love, Christian friends. God's love for us becomes our love for one another. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, strengthen our faith so that we unfailingly come to you in prayer for all our bodily needs. Give us a special measure of your power and give that also to those who are sorrowful or are mourning, to those who are in pain or sickness, to those who may be in temptation or peril, that they may receive your blessing and aid and help us patiently endure any chastening and afflictions you permit to come into our lives, knowing that you are using them in love to prepare us for that joyful communion with you, which was our, is ours for all eternity. Keep our eyes focused on the eternal home, 
that you are preparing for us. In Jesus' name we pray, and in his name we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.